Good morning. Good morning. Listen, if, if everyone could find a seat real quickly, I, I tell you what, we, it's, it's not often that we have a speaker on campus like the speaker we've got today, and I want to be sure and give him plenty of time. Uh, welcome and good morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, for our friends that uh, have come a long way, we know that several folks have come from Central Texas, not close to San Marcos. Thanks for getting up early and driving over. Uh, joining our faculty members who are fortunate enough not have a class this period, some of our faculty here with us, and primarily our honor students. Raise your hand if you're an honor student. Yeah. We're glad you're here. They get a chance to see what it's like to be in a college class because it'll be a lecture that'll be like they'll have when they are in college. And they'll have one of the best lecturers in, in the world, not just in this country, that'll be here with us today. So welcome all of you to San Marcos Academy. Today we continue the San Marcos Academy Texas State Distinguished Lecture Series. Today's lecture is entitled C.S. Lewis Chronicles of a Master Communicator. And our speaker himself is a master communicator. Our speaker is Dr. Stephen Beebe. He is a Regents and University Distinguished Professor at Texas State University where he serves as chairman of the Department of Communication Studies. He's also associate dean of the College of Fine Arts and Communication. In fact, we're pleased to have the dean, Dr. Mote, here with us today from the same college, Fine Arts and Communication. Dr. Beebe, as most of our students know, because we visited a little bit with, with them about Dr. Beebe, he is a visiting scholar at Cambridge University. He's taught classes on C.S. Lewis at Oxford University, and his biggest challenge today is to see if he can, in just about an hour, cover what he covers in a whole semester at Oxford University. And we have very bright honor students, and I think that they're up to it, Dr. Beebe, if you're up to it. Dr. Beebe is the author of 12 uh, books that have been used and adopted by over 1,200 colleges and universities around the world. He's president-elect of the National Communication Association, which is the largest professional communication association in the world. He's married to Sue Beebe. Raise your hand, Sue. She's here with us today, a professor at uh, Texas State University in the English department. And uh, the, the Beebe's um, have two grown children, Mark and Matt Beebe. So now C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of a Master Communicator. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Beebe. Well, good morning. good morning. Isn't this a beautiful lecture hall? I understand it's been beautifully refurbished, and I'm delighted to be here. But as nice as this is, I really wish we could be somewhere else this morning. I thought about you last week, thought about each and every one of you, when I was in Oxford, and I had lunch with Walter Hooper a week ago. Now, so as some of you might know, Walter Hooper was C.S. Lewis's personal secretary the last few months of Lewis's life. And I've had an opportunity, Sue and I, to uh, get acquainted with Walter. And I always learn something new whenever I interact with Walter. For example, um, I ask him, so what did, what did C.S. Lewis have for breakfast? I just, just kind of an odd kind of, but, but how did, and Walter said, well, he would start his day. I would bring him his tea at 8 o'clock in the morning. And then Lewis liked to fix his own breakfast. He would usually have, he said, um, eggs, sausage or bacon, and then if the housekeeper had made scones, he loved scones, he would have those. But Walter said what he really liked were digestive biscuits. You know what digestive biscuits are? They're actually little cookies, uh, kind of semi-sweet cookies, but Walter said he would eat those all day. Lewis loved tea. Uh, so I wish you could have been with me to have this conversation about C.S. Lewis with Walter Hooper. Walter tells the story, he said, it was the only debate with C.S. Lewis that I ever won. Lewis thought, when I'm gone, no one will be interested in reading my books. Walter said, you're wrong. When you're gone, 
you have written something that people will remember. No, said Lewis. Our presence here today suggests that Walter Hooper won that debate. So we're to talk about C.S. Lewis. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of Lewis's death. 50 years after he died, his works are more popular than ever. To help me get to know you a little bit, especially some of the students, how many of you here have read the Narnia Chronicles? Have you read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Well, if you were in Blackwell's bookstore, the largest bookstore in Oxford, in 1950, here's what you'd see. This is the first edition published in 1950 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's the book you'd, you'd, you'd see if you, and maybe if you were fortunate enough to have Lewis autograph a copy. Um, how about uh, just every, how many have read Mere Christianity? Just have anybody have a sense of that. Screw tape letters. What about, how many of you read something other than those books of Lewis? Great, great. So Walter was right. Lewis was wrong. Who is C.S. Lewis? Who is he really? I want to chat with you this morning about three questions. Who was Lewis? Why is he important? What is it about Lewis? Why is it that we're gathered here today? What is it about Lewis that made him important? And finally, I can't resist since uh, what I do in my day job is I'm a professor of communication. I want to talk about Lewis and communication. What is it from the standpoint of his communication that made Lewis an effective communicator? Lewis was born on November 29th, 1898. He died on November 22nd, 1963. Does that date sound familiar to you? November 22nd, 1963. He died the same hour that President Kennedy died on that day. If Lewis were here today, if he were your speaker, here's what one person says Lewis looked like. He's something of an everyman, said William Griffin, in that he was just a bloke. Some thought he looked like a farmer. Others thought he looked like a butcher, jowly cheeks, red face, shabby clothes, and he certainly enjoyed a plowman's lunch as much as the next fellow, especially with a pint of cider, a bottle of stout at the trout. The trout was one of his favorite places to go. It's about a two-mile walk outside of Oxford. Uh, I had lunch there last week as well and thought about you and wished you could have been there for lunch as we would have had this conversation. But he was just one of the millions, says Griffin, one of the millions trying to make his way, his own spiritual way, and it was well known that he wasn't the best map reader in the brigade. He was like all of us. C.S. Lewis was trying to find his way, his way home. He was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. His father, Albert Lewis, his mother, Flora Hamilton. This is what Lewis says about his family. My father's people were true Welshmen. Sentimental, passionate, and rhetorical, easily moved to anger and to tenderness. Men who laughed and cried a great deal and who had not much of the talent for happiness. And this is what he says about his mother's side. He says, the Hamiltons were a cooler race. Their minds were critical and ironic, and they had a talent for happiness in a very high degree. In some respects, his parents mirror some of his own talents. Some say that in everything Lewis wrote, you can find elements of both his sense of logic and reason and his sense of imagination and creativity. Lewis would trace that, trace that back to his own parents. He had a very happy childhood. Um, he said, I'm a product of long corridors, empty sunlit rooms, upstairs indoor silences, attics explored in silence, distant noises of gurgling cisterns and pipes and the noise of wind under the tile. Also, he says, of endless books, nothing was forbidden me. In the seemingly endless rainy afternoons, I took volume after volume from the shelves. Lewis loved to read, and that shaped his early life. He had a wonderful nurse who would read him stories. Lewis began writing children's stories. Boxen was one of his first stories. But then he, when he was almost 10 years old, his life changed dramatically. His mother had cancer and she died. Lewis says in his autobiography, with my mother's death, 
all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable disappeared from my life. There was to be some fun, many pleasures, stabs of joy, but no more of the old security, wrote C.S. Lewis 50 years after his mother died. He says, it was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like Atlantis. His father, at the death of, of, of his wife and Lewis's mother, Lewis's father was um, not a gifted person when it comes to empathy or caring was quite troubled and sent Lewis off to uh, a series of terrible boarding schools. In fact, his first boarding school, the headmaster was declared insane. <laughs> Lewis would complain and his father said, no, you can stick it out. And for several years, Lewis had this terrible education uh, until he was 15 years old and Lewis's father sent Lewis to uh, see William T. Kirkpatrick. Kirk, or the great knock. Uh, Kirk, the great knock, had also been Lewis's father's tutor as well as Lewis's brother. Lewis had a, an older brother, Warney, three years older than Lewis. And Lewis remembers the first time he met his teacher. He was picked up at the train station and his teacher, Kirkpatrick, met him and got in the car and they were driving and Lewis casually said, the countryside of Surrey seems wilder than I expected. And then Lewis says, Kirk said, shout, stop, and said it made him jump when he shouted and when he, and when he said stop. What do you mean by wildness? What grounds do you have for not expecting it? I replied, I don't know. Um, he says, answer after answer was sh shredded and at last in dawn on me, he really wanted to know. And then what Kirk said was, unless you've been here before, you have no basis for your expectation. How would you like it if on your first day of class, your teacher asks you, um, so how was your summer vacation? Well, and you say it was, uh, it was fine. And your teacher would say, stop, what do you mean by fine? What basis do you have of comparing that with other summers? You've not yet had, that was the kind of experience Lewis had. Or some would have been startled by that. Lewis said, I loved it. I finally had a teacher who wanted to know what I really thought and took the time to help me develop that sense of logic. He came to Oxford in 1917 as a student. He actually failed the exam to get into Oxford. He failed the math exam. And, but they let him in on a trial basis. He joined the military, and that's how Lewis got into Oxford. If you join the military, they let you in Oxford University. Lewis, uh, fairly soon, the, I, he would be marching around Keeble College on the grounds of Keeble College, and he met Patty Moore. That was to have a major, even though they had a short relationship, it was to have a profound relationship on C.S. Lewis for the rest of his life. Patty and Lewis made a pact. Imagine you making this kind of pact. The pact was, if one of us are killed in the war, the remaining person left will take care of either the father or the mother. Lewis had a father. Patty Moore had a mother. Patty Moore was killed. And Lewis made good on that promise and took care of Mrs. Moore. In fact, he would often introduce Mrs. Moore as his mother. And so that was to be a profound relationship. Lewis was very successful at Oxford University. He earned a triple first now I say that and no one here gasps. But you know what that means? It would be like, here's what it would be like. It would be like being valedictorian of three different classes in three different subjects to get a triple first. He was one of the few people in the 20th century to get a triple first. C.S. Lewis received a triple first at Oxford University. Now you can gasp. So that's a little about who C.S. Lewis was a person, a student. All he really wanted to be was a poet, but he was much more than that. That brings me to my second question is, so why is C.S. Lewis important today? What is it from this 20th century wannabe poet, bright poet, triple first, Oxford, interesting person, what is it about him that attracts us and the books that you have read? You're not alone. 
in reading C.S. Lewis if you've raised your hand at one of my questions when I ask, have you read C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis, his books have sold over 250 uh, million books, a quarter of a billion books. He wrote 37 books. His books have been translated into 30 languages. There are three stained glass windows honoring C.S. Lewis, one in Texas, one in California, and one at his home church in Headington, Headington Quarry in Oxford. In the United States alone, there are three C.S. Lewis institutes, one C.S. Lewis foundation that has as its goal to establish a C.S. Lewis college. There are over 500 C.S. Lewis societies. There are two C.S. Lewis societies in Austin, Texas. Now, maybe there are societies in Austin, Texas of Shakespeare. I don't know. I don't know of any, but I know of two about C.S. Lewis. Hundreds of courses about Lewis. The most popular class at Harvard University today is a class about Lewis and Freud, contrasting their two worldviews. Over 200 theses and dissertations, hundreds of internet sites, Many movies, you've seen the movies of the Narnia Chronicles, some of those out. Have you seen Shadowlands, the movie about his life? Anybody here seen the movie Shadowlands? If you have, the one with Anthony Hopkins and Deborah Winger, uh, then, then of course you probably know, I'm sure you, you've recognized that, that Sue and I are in that movie. It happened to be filmed, well, we're, we're, we are in it. We're only in it for just a little bit. It happened to be filmed the, the year we were in Oxford and there's one crowd scene that lasts about a quarter of a second, but we think we can find ourselves <laughs> in that movie nonetheless. <coughs> Go to any bookstore today and ask, do you have any books on C.S. Lewis? Go out to Hastings here in San Marcos and look for books about C.S. Lewis. What you'll find is he's not in one place, but in several places. Yes, you'll find him in the religion section and his Christian apologetics, but you'll also find him in the children's section, the Narnia books, of course. Have you read his science fiction books? He's in that section as well. He's certainly known for his books on literary criticism. Among his most popular books, several of you said you read The Screwtape Letters, published in 1942. They didn't print very many of these. This is the first edition of C.S. Lewis' screw table. This is what it would have looked like, newly published in 1942. They didn't print very many because they thought, well, who would want to read a book by an Oxford professor about devils having a conversation? But many people did. This is a copy of screw tape letters, uh, a rebound first edition. What's special about this copy is this is the copy of the Archbishop of Canterbury's copy of screw tape letters. Jeffrey Francis Fisher, who was Archbishop from 1945 to 1961, first edition of screw tape letters owned by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Maybe even rarer than that, and this box is a pre-first edition of screw tape letters. What's in here is a publisher's proof, even before it was published that Lewis or his editor would have used to determine if the book was good enough to go to press. Other books that are popular, Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity, as you probably know, uh, was published in 1952, uh, the first time. First edition of Mere Christianity. This is a British first edition, so it was the first time, this book is the first time his broadcast talks were put together in one volume. But before that, they were published in smaller volumes. Lewis' first uh, presentation was on Wednesday, August 6, 1941 at 745. He was only to do one or two lectures, but they were so successful, 